Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining our sixth webinar in the telehealth series hosted by the Delaware Healthcare Commission. My name is Amanda White. I'm a senior consultant at HMA and I've been providing support to this extremely informative webinar series. So today we're going to be discussing telehealth vendor and equipment selection. Our main speakers today are going to be David Bergman and Dr. Greg Vaishan, who are both principal consultants at HMA. Um, the first part of the webinar is going to be a review of the state's regulations, which include technology, site requirements, and emerging Medicare regulations. The second part is going to be an overview of the vendor and equipment selection process. And then the third part is going to be some use case examples. Um, before we get into the slides, just a friendly reminder that your phone should be muted during the presentation. But if you have any questions or comments throughout the webinar, please do feel free to go ahead and type them into the chat box. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So this is just an overview slide that speaks to the origin of telehealth and how it aligns with BHI activities, addresses shortages with specialty care, and concerns identified through um, system transformation work. Next slide. Uh, here's a disclosure statement that HMA does not endorse any specific vendors for telehealth or digital health platforms, um, though we do endorse the idea that telehealth is important and impactful in healthcare transformation. So for that reason, we do work with a number of companies in the digital health space. Next slide. Here's a list of all the webinars we've had in this series, and as you'll see, we only have one more left, um, and the, that one will be on use cases from the field. Next slide. Um, this is our wonderful panel of HMAers who have been providing um, support and developing the content for this series, um, and we can go ahead and move to the next slide. David, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much. So as uh, Amanda mentioned, we have several things that we're going to be going over today. So we'll be reviewing the requirements in the Delaware state regulations um, around technology, the site requirements, and some of the emerging Medicare regulations. Um, we're going to go through the selection process, and then we have a series of use cases, and then we'll open up the floor for some question and answer from the group. So next slide. And keep going. All right. So to start off with, we wanted to just create a common platform so everybody understands some of the basic terminology that we're using. And these, were, these are probably terms you're familiar with from some of the other webinars if you've been listening in on them. Um, and I mention them here in part because they are important components of how you think about what kinds of tools uh, you will ultimately use as part of your uh, vendor selection process. So the distant site obviously is the location of where the provider is or the consulting provider. The originating site is where the patient is. Um, so the site originates where the care is actually being delivered and that care is always being delivered to the patient. So that's an easy way to think about it. A referring provider is the provider who has initially evaluated the patient and determined that they have a need for uh, some additional support, whether that's through uh, a specialist or um, through the distant or consulting provider. Um, and, you know, conversely, the consulting provider is the provider that's delivering the care um, remotely to the patient, so via the telehealth system. And finally, the last piece is encryption. And encryption is important here because it's what protects the information that's flowing back and forth between the, uh, the consultant provider and the referring provider. Um, and all of that information has to be done uh, at um, a fairly high secure le security level. Um, this is the data that's in transit that needs to be secured. And you know, one of the common ways of doing this is through what's called SSL. It's the S in HTTPS, um, and it uses an encryption standard at um, typically at 256 uh, bits. So it's a fairly complicated cipher that protects that information flowing back and forth. Next, next slide, please. The technology requirements in the state of Delaware. Um, 
you know, really look at both the audio and the video components. Um, and they're defined as the equipment that permits the two-way real-time interaction between the patient and the provider or uh, the practitioner that's at the distant site. So the, the general description here is the secure video conferencing, which can be done via personal computers, tablets, or other mobile devices that all meet the requirements for telemedicine. Sometimes you'll see in other states that there are requirements around uh, for example, the um, the resolution on the camera that's being used. Um, Delaware doesn't specify anything, but obviously you should have sufficient resolution and bandwidth to support uh, being able to view the patients. Um, so in this case, a computer like a laptop that has a standard uh, camera and a microphone setup will meet the equipment requirements. Um, you could also potentially connect via a smartphone with a smartphone application um, that would allow a provider to communicate directly with the patient. Um, but there are some additional components of that, so it's not just you know connecting with the patient anywhere. Um, and then finally, it's the real-time encrypted screen, uh, streaming through the use of some of these items. So there are. Um, uh, telemedicine vendors that use more sophisticated tools, for example, that would allow a provider to pan, tilt, or zoom the camera lens as needed. Um, those are not required in Delaware, um, so it provides you with a lot more flexibility about um, using systems that are, in some cases, a little more streamlined uh, that will still allow you to uh, bill for these services. Next slide. So for the site requirements, um, the distant site, i.e. where the provider is located, has to be a site that has been enrolled with the uh, Delaware Medicaid program or with uh, a Delaware Medicaid uh, managed care organization. So it generally must be a U.S. facility and it has to be in the continental U.S. And those distant sites are not eligible for what's called a facility fee. The originating site, i.e. where the patient is located, um, can include any of the same sites that are also uh, distant sites so that they are um, uh, enrolled in DMAP, um, but they could also include where the, the patient uh, lives or a day program or an alternate, alternate location in which the member is physically present. Um, those all of those can be, well, not all of those, some of those can be used uh, to generate what's called this facility fee. Um, and the patient's home can be used if the communication is a HIPAA compliant and private. So you can't, you know, you wouldn't be able to conduct a telemedicine visit while the patient is sitting in a bus, for example, um, because that's not a HIPAA compliant environment where the patient is. But if the patient is at home, um, you would be more than um, capable of doing it there. However, the patient's home is not considered a, a site for the purposes of originating a site fee. Um, so the site fees you really think about are from medical facility to medical facility, um, and but you can still do uh, telehealth if it's from the patient's home. There's just no site fee uh, that's associated with that. Next slide. There are some emerging Medicare rules um, so that are likely to be, um, they're sort of emerging on the horizon um, that are potentially important here. So um, again, we're looking at audio and video equipment that permits two-way real-time interactive communication. Um, so um, you know, all of these systems would be capable of doing these things. Um, and this secure video conferencing, these are all components that uh, would serve some of these purposes. Um, and again, this is the encrypted streaming via the use of the video camera, the audio equipment, and the monitor. Um, Greg, I know you actually had some additional pieces here and wondered if you wanted to add a couple of components. Well, I, I would just say that, um, you know, not, not only the, uh, the Medicare rules, but uh, California now uh, coming out with uh, a uh, all-plan letter, uh, so that's Medicaid specifically, but uh, 
you know, will apply in, in California generally. Um, and and they're uh, similar to these uh, emerging uh, Medicare rules. Um, so in terms of, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, not much more in terms of requirements for specifics on, uh, on the um, equipment, for instance. Great. Well, thank you. Um, next slide. All right, that's me. Uh, this is Greg Beishan. I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, introduce uh, myself. I'm a physician uh, in internal medicine. I, I still am seeing uh, patients. I'm in the Chicago office and see patients on the south side of Chicago and FQHC. Um, I've uh, at HMA done a uh, a lot of work over the years. I've been with HMA for 10 years in uh, primary care delivery and uh, that primary care inside of an integrated delivery system, uh, specifically looking at uh, IT and uh, data components of that integration. And so, uh, and, and, and as well, um, have uh, founded a, a digital health company um, and worked with a number of companies in the digital health space. And, and throughout all of those, uh, have had the opportunity to um, uh, work through, wrestle through this process of uh, selecting uh, vendors. Uh, a very small bit on equipment, it's uh, same uh, principles, but uh, quite a bit uh, uh, in, the, in the vendor space. So I'm glad to uh, be here and to share some of that uh, with you if you want to. Uh, go to the next slide, that'd be great. Uh, this here gives us uh, kind of a bird's eye view of the process of um, uh, selecting uh, either a vendor or um, uh, equipment. And, uh, you know, the first thing on there is really defining the business plan. That's, that's critical. It's going to really, uh, you know, uh, flow into the next step and flow throughout. Without without the business plan in place, um, uh, you won't uh, be able to do this. And we did uh, here. Uh, there was a webinar which is referenced here at the bottom um, and, and is recorded, so you can you can listen to that uh, from uh, uh, Uche and, and Mary Kate. Um, I'm going to have some slides on some of the specifics uh, in this in this flow, but let me just take you uh, through the flow quickly uh, and highlight some of these. Um, so first is defining that uh, business plan, and then you're uh, identifying functions. You're going into your business plan and saying, okay, what are the functional things that we need to accomplish that, that will have to be performed by a vendor or that we need equipment for? Um, you look out there and see what's there, uh, identify choices, you make requirements. Okay, so these are very specific things. We have high-level functions, but requirements are very specific things, uh, and we'll go over that uh, in, a, in a subsequent slide. Uh, and then creating a vendor information sheet. So this is going to be a way for you to uh, organize. Okay, I know what the functions are. I know the requirements. Now, how do they play out across uh, a number of uh, solution uh, uh, solutions for this, either an equipment or or, or a vendor? Um, and as you're gathering uh, that information, uh, you'll you'll modify and refine the requirements. Oftentimes, as you're you know uh, filling these out and and uh, getting the specifics from vendors, you find out things that indeed are important uh, in the marketplace uh, for your uh, business. Uh, things that you didn't uh, uh, identify as requirements to begin with. Uh, so you modify those, or you may find out, and it's occasional that you made a requirement that you know just really uh, isn't available out there at a reasonable uh, price and that you're going to have to kind of uh, uh, dial back your requirements somewhat. So you're, you're modifying and refi refining those. Um, and then a, a useful process is uh, scoring and weighting those. So, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but, you know, having a, a quantitative formal process for, uh, you know, seeing where uh, the different uh, solutions, either equipment or vendor, uh, uh, fall out. And then if you need to, uh, depending on your organization, bid it out, you do so, or, or uh, hopefully more, more likely negotiate on the, uh, on the P 
piece of equipment uh, or um, or the uh, service that's going to be provided. And if you can, uh, that kind of final step, uh, oftentimes there's an opportunity to uh, trial or pilot, uh, not, not uh, you know, first choice for your, uh, from, from those who you're uh, purchasing this from. Uh, nonetheless, if you can, uh, if you can get that, it's uh, often uh, good for, uh, uh, good for you, but not always. Uh, sometimes a trial or pilot period means that you have to put a lot of uh, time and effort into that. And if you already know, hey, this is where we need to go, uh, then that would not make sense. All right, if we can go to the next uh, next slide. Um, for high cost uh, investments, before you even really get started uh, down that road of, of uh, selecting a piece of equipment or um, or a vendor, and this this readiness assessment example here is about uh, equipment, but we have uh, more content uh, on on the vendor side. Uh, but before you go in there, you're going to want to kind of uh, do a readiness assessment. Are we ready to uh, make this selection? Um, and one of the first pieces, of course, is doing that uh, uh, business plan. Uh, but as you're really getting down to uh, picking out the um, equipment. Or the or the vendor, you want to uh, answer some questions for yourself to make to make sure you're ready. And what what you see on the top right there are some uh, particular around the space. Uh, if you're doing uh, uh, visits and you're going to buy some video equipment, do you actually have the space to uh, perform those um, uh, those video visits? And and if not, that's something to go to the drawing board first before you uh, pick out your uh, uh, pick out your equipment. Um, so we have we have uh, more of these available, and you can uh, let us know if you need this to do a readiness assessment before uh, really going down that uh, path. You can go to the next uh, next slide. Um, if you if you listen to Mary Kate's and Uche's uh, uh, webinar on the business plan, you'll you'll recognize this. Um, and that's because, you know, for high cost investments, you, you need to do and you need to bring together a team uh, to create that business plan. And that's what uh, Mary Kate was talking about. And also, as you're for a high cost uh, component of that business plan, if it includes getting an external vendor or buying equipment, you're going to want to bring together a uh, team as well. And this, this is because, you know, as you're uh, making choices on the equipment, this uh, really impacts uh, workflow. So it's not only about, you know, here's what, here's what we're going to do and with this vendor and have this piece of equipment. It's really, does the uh, uh, setup, how is that going to uh, impact uh, the clinic itself? So having the nurse uh, clinic manager there to uh, help give input and, uh, and and resolve that is is very important. And then there's things like you know that just important as getting the exact right equipment is having the coordination between uh, if you're doing a distant site having coordination of having available the patient at the right time the uh, consulting provider at the right time so having those scheduling uh, systems uh, match up. There's a lot of process issues that uh, you're going to want to make sure. Uh, are in place. Uh, so, um, uh, a big team here, and as Mary Kate said, the, some of these roles, the team members, could be a single person. It could be that the telehealth program manager is the executive champion. Uh, but certainly, uh, bringing in uh, clinicians, nurses, and medical medical assistant uh, staff is is important. Uh, okay, and for both of these, I said high cost investment. So if we go to the, the uh, next slide, um, it, it's important to uh, have your effort in selection, you know, be matching the uh, costs of of that uh, equipment and vendor. And and as I was alluding to, the there's a lot more to it than the than the actual cost of the uh, of the service or the equipment. Um, and, and thinking about it in terms of this concept of total cost of ownership, uh, which you'll hear about in a, in a business plan or a startup or, you know, a, um, uh, a vendor coming to you to, to offer uh, some 
uh, some service. What you want to know is uh, how does this affect uh, how does this affect my operations in total? Um, so there's obviously you'll be looking at the purchase price, but it's and, and the cost of installing it, right? So those will be right up front. But there's also install time. How long will I need to be down? How much effort will I need to put of my staff into this, et cetera? Um, ongoing uh, use fees, if they're per provider or if they're per event, uh, it's important to uh, to map those out and know what those are. Uh, training time, uh, is there a cost for the training? Is there a time that you're how much time, because there will be time, how much time is it is necessary for staff to do that training? Um, what what does the maintenance and repair look like? Is that included? Is upgrades included in the software if it is software? Um, and then um, is there any extra bandwidth that you're going to need to install? Is it $150 instead of $50 to have the, uh, you know, uh, one gigabyte uh, connection that you need for this piece of equipment, for instance. Um, and then uh, thinking about labor that it will take to do this above and beyond whatever the lo lowest cost alternative is. So there's the there's the most efficient way of uh, providing this with X, Y, Z service. Now we're going to maybe use this other uh, lower cost piece of equipment. But wait a second, we've got to count in the total cost of ownership that extra labor that it's going to take. Uh, to have, for instance, a solution where we're going to have to manually input uh, some of the uh, some of the data. So total cost of ownership important to think about, and uh, informs whether you're you know how much effort you're going to put into the uh, selection process, and whether you're going to bring that whole big team, or whether you can really uh, you know uh, have it more a concentrated effort. Okay, we can look to the uh, next slide. Um, and and. With that, I wanted to, uh, you know, further uh, highlight that uh, total cost of ownership uh, piece with with a visual. And what you're seeing here is a, uh, you know, let's say 79 cent uh, bottle of water. It's, it's relatively small. Looks like it, it may be a off brand, uh, but a, a relatively uh, small, low cost uh, a bottle of water. But we'll go to the next uh, slide has other costs, other effects, other downstream uh, uh, problems that it causes. And what you're seeing here is out in the Pacific Ocean, a large swirl uh, of garbage where uh, kind of the, uh, the, the stuff that we uh, have run off into our streams and uh, hit the Pacific Ocean and eventually makes its way into the center here. And uh, you know that cost of pollution is not counted in that 79 uh, cents. Um, and nor nor is the uh, carbon create the plastic et cetera et cetera. There's there's a, a bunch of costs in there, uh, which is all to say that uh, as you are doing your business plan, as you're thinking about your equipment or your vendor, uh, think about all of the downstream uh, costs that could be occurring from uh, from using that. Okay, we'll go to the uh, next slide. Um, so just a little deeper dive on those on that flow that we talked about uh, up above and uh, you know right after the business plan was the these functions and those are the things that the uh, equipment or software is going to do um, an example is uh, you know providing a secure AV connection right that uh, um, David talked about so uh, that might be the the function of it or uh, to provide uh, quick reliable advice from uh, specialists uh, to the to the PCP, right? And that's an example of e-consults. We'll go more into that. Uh, so, but those are the high-level functions. Then you do a market scan, and that could just be, you know, Google. Uh, it could be going to uh, experts at uh, uh, advocacy uh, organizations, um, and, uh, and you know, like like those who are um, uh, supporting this um, uh, webinar. Uh, it could be your network, right? Um, and it could be uh, professional experts or, or, or consultants. Um, so, but getting that market scan, what are all the choices out there? Um, and then creating requirements. Uh, and these are really getting down to the specifics. Um, and one of them might be encryption, uh, which David talked about, and very specific. It might be, hey, this has got to be 256-bit uh, encryption. Um, or it might be uh, something like, uh, you know, have features that 
allow for relationship building between the specialist and the PCP. You know, if you're talking about e-consult, that might be a specific requirement uh, that you're uh, looking for. Or you might get it even down to, hey, I want to see uh, a photo as the way of uh, helping to create that relationship, a photo of the PCP. Um, so different ways and different specificity that you get the requirements. Um, and it may be that different vendors uh, will help create that relationship in different ways. So it, it may be that really the requirement is to is to create that. All right, we can go to the next uh, next slide. Uh, this is uh, a sample sheet, uh, the information sheet that was kind of the next uh, the next slide. You take those requirements, you get them into an information sheet. You look at uh, a few different uh, vendors or equipment suppliers uh, or specific pieces of equipment um, and uh, figure out your uh, total uh, cost of ownership and what is the revenue that'll come straight out of your uh, business plan what is the expected revenue from from that uh, uh, in using that vendor or using that piece of equipment putting this whole thing into place um, and then having some uh, either categorical, like yes, no, or quantitative way of, uh, of defining each one of these so, so that you'll be able to uh, do a scoring system uh, for it at the end. And some of those uh, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, scoring pieces, quantitative scoring pieces, might be the one to five Likert scale. Um, and that's like the personalization of a consult. And you might ask across the group how strong did you think this vendor was versus this vendor in that. Um, it could be uh, a specific uh, number like the minutes that it takes to uh, do the uh, data entry on the e-console. So uh, putting out the important things here, um, some of them you know, are yes, no, because let's say you must have a behavioral health uh, provider in pediatrics uh, because of the practice that you're in, and that's really what you're um, getting this for most importantly. And so that's just a yes, no, and if there's no, it's it's that's not the right uh, vendor for you. So this is just an uh, example of that, and uh, we'll go to the next uh, next slide. Uh, these are some other things that you'll have on that sheet. So it, it's not you know just uh, six or seven rows long, um, it, and it is information as well as scoring items. So those those were the you know having the scoring items at the top, but things that you'll want to know about. Uh, about each vendor, like what are their company characteristics? Uh, you know, who, what other parts of the market are they serving? Who are they serving? Um, and uh, yeah, their reference checks. Uh, can they give you similar uh, organizations and similar type of uh, services uh, for other places? Um, reporting capabilities that might be scored out. It's an important piece to you. Uh, supported devices, encryption, all, all those things that we. Uh, we've talked about before. At the end there, you see an important one, uh, TCPA, uh, you know, meeting regulations essentially, uh, meeting the regulations that David talked about uh, in Delaware would be one that you would have on here. Uh, but other regs, and I'll go over TCPA as we get to the use cases. You can go to the next slide. Um, so then the scoring sheet, uh, it doesn't need to be perfect, right? You had an example there of uh, the input across those three vendors. You give those weights. Having a team uh, kind of coalesce around those weights will help you uh, to build consensus in the team on, on what uh, vendor or what piece of equipment is better, uh, is the right one. And it will also help you in bidding if you need to do that. Uh, and hopefully you, you would not, but if you need to, then, then this, is, uh, this is helpful. And then, as I said before, getting that trial period uh, can certainly be uh, certainly be helpful, uh, but not worth it if it's going to take a lot of time and energy of the team, and you know what you need. Uh, all right, we'll go to the uh, next slide, and this is uh, where uh, David and I are going to talk about some uh, use cases uh, that that hopefully will uh, uh, further uh, define. Uh, the concepts that we've been talking about. Great. Thanks, Greg. Next slide. So, you know, to contextualize this, we thought, you know, rather than talking in the abstract about, um, you know, some of the regulations and policies, that it would be helpful to talk about how they impact things on a specific use case basis. So, we've identified four use cases 
um, one that's looking at provider to patient, one that's looking at um, sort of provider to patient where the patient is at home, one that's provider to patient where the patient is in a medical office, provider to provider, and then a system to patient. So these are all different ways that you can be using these technologies to support um, improved care and care access for patients. So for this one in particular, um, you know, the prior provider has previously scheduled a telehealth appointment with the patient. Um, so they have a specific time that's set up in order to conduct this meeting. And the provider sits down, you know, let's say it's in front of a computer uh, in order to conduct this visit. So they, um, they call up the application, they dial the appropriate number for the patient. Um, the patient most likely has some kind of a smartphone application that's connected with uh, this platform um, so they can receive the call. And part of what that does is it ensures that there is this encrypted communication that's tr transferring back and forth um, and um, so that you know somebody can't inadvertently or even deliberately um, uh, spy in on what that conversation is like. And, and critically here, um, there should be some kind of a business associates agreement between your um, provider practice and the, um, the telehealth vendor. Um, and what that does is it creates an effective um, legal construct for sharing the information. Um, there's some ambiguity around this in the law, but the, the operating principle of most of these telemedicine companies um, is really around uh, making sure that there is this appropriate legal framework in which to share all of this information. Um, and so that's really why it's necessary to have a BAA that's signed and executed with your telehealth vendor. Um, and then finally, in terms of the configuration of this specific platform, um, the Delaware regulations do require that these systems not be capable of saving the uh, communication in a remote location. Um, so the, it, there's another form of um, telehealth that's also known as store and forward, where a patient could either record a message or answer um, some responses on a questionnaire and have that saved and forwarded to a provider for evaluation. And in Delaware, though that is not considered a valid form of telehealth or telemedicine. Um, so it has to be this live, real-time, interactive communication between a provider and the patient. Um, so, you know, the application that has all of these features would be appropriate for use in Delaware. The provider would initiate the session by calling up the, the patient, the patient would answer. Um, and then the provider would continue to document all of the normal care delivery components uh, within their existing electronic health record. Um, and they would bill it as a normal visit. And that's how you would conduct this, uh, um, this particular telehealth appointment. And, you know, the patient could really be anywhere um, as long as it's a, a, a private location um, that the patient feels comfortable having this conversation in. Um, you know, it could potentially go to their, in this, in this specific instance, it's going to their smartphone. So they could be sitting on the couch in their living room uh, holding up the phone um, in order to, to have this conversation. Um, next slide. The second instance that we've identified here is where a patient goes into a visit with a provider and physically, and the provider identifies that the patient has a need for getting some kind of outside counsel. And, you know, this could be an on-the-fly consultation or it could actually be something that's scheduled where the patient comes back at another time to the initial provider's facility, their clinic, um, and uh, for the scheduled time. And, and the scheduled time would be made in arrangement with that third party, uh, that third party provider. And it's really critical here that you're making sure operationally that 
all of the involved uh, parties know what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. So there should be some kind of a, a shared appointment um, so that everybody can can be informed about what's going to happen and where it's going to happen. And you know, often for the initiating provider, um, the there's a separate room where the telehealth visit can take place. Um, so it could be an exam room where there's a laptop that's available to initiate the discussion. Um, it could be, you know, a separate room that has a door that can be closed. Um, so all of the sort of the operations are all set up with this remote provider. Um, the on-site provider would take the patient to this specific telehealth room and initiate the session with the remote provider um, and confirm the start of the session. And then, you know, the telehealth application that the provider is using on both ends, both the distant and the um, the um, the um, the current provider, the uh, originating site, um, would have the same application and they could initiate it. Again, the application has all of this, so those same features that we talked about. It's a desktop computer to a laptop computer in this instance. Um, it's encrypted communication that's going back and forth. There's a signed executed BAA between the referring provider and the, um, the um, telehealth platform, and it has the save function that's disabled. And then, you know, finally, the remote provider would deliver the care. They would document the delivery of that service in their own electronic health record. They would go ahead and bill for it as a normal visit. Um, but the referring provider would also be able to bill a facility charge um, with a, a Q3014 and with a revenue center code uh, that's attached to that. So they get some sort of compensation for hosting the patient when they're engaged in this uh, initial telehealth visit. Um, so those are two different ways of using these systems in order to support um, increased access for patients and uh, improve quality of care. So and Greg was gonna take us through our next one. All right, great. Um, this uh, use case is about uh, a peer-to-peer, -peer, a provider-to-provider -provider, uh, digital health um, uh, interaction. Um, and this, this is, uh, you know, of the uh, area that, that David talked about, that asynchronous um, interaction. In other words, the uh, time that the uh, the, the question, the, the consult, the referral uh, is generated um, is different from, in time and place, from the answer back. Um, so, you know, obviously there's not a, a, a real-time video connection that needs to uh, be made there, but, you know, this is a uh, important uh, and, and growing um, uh, solution for for what is a real problem in a lot of uh, populations and areas for uh, getting the, the specialty opinion that that's needed. Um, so rural areas, uh, you know, specifically for um, uh, uninsured or underinsured, uh, certainly there's uh, uh, very difficult access issues in uh, Medicaid in in many uh, in many states. Um, so this is a way. Uh, for providers to get that opinion because a majority, an actual majority of uh, specialty uh, consultations uh, can be uh, answered and dealt with without having the uh, patient actually physically be uh, present or the specialist and the patient to have an interaction. In other words, there's a, there's a question that the, that the primary care provider uh, has and that might be about, uh, you know, the workup given these kind of uh, symptoms, uh, or it might be I've tried uh, medication X, Y, Z. Uh, what would you think is uh, the next most appropriate given this patient's history? Um, and that those can be uh, uh, well dealt with uh, at a different, at, at, with this asynchronous, uh, asynchronous process. 
Um, so, and, and, and asynchronous, but there also may be uh, back and forth communication. So it, it, it's, uh, you know, not, not always, and as a matter of fact, a significant portion of the time, there'll be a, um, a need for uh, some uh, back and forth. Oh, yes, uh, those tests, well, I can't get, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, that particular uh, hemoglobin electrophoresis, uh, you know, that you're looking for. Uh, can will this one work? So you know, back and forth between the uh, specialist and the uh, uh, primary care provider is is part of this. But again, asynchronously. So the the uh, application features that that one needs um, are are somewhat less rigorous, but there's there's some there's some choices there and, and ways to go about it. Uh, one is to have it you know fully integrated into the electronic medical record. Um, so it, if it's within a system and everyone's using the same EMR or if there's a opportunity for EMR to EMR that, you know, putting the order in and the referral in, in one, um, by the PCP, uh, can directly get that and, and have the result, uh, come back all within that, uh, same EMR. There's different ways to do that embeddedness. Um, that's not the, you know, usual, uh, way that, in these uh, higher need uh, populations and, and geographies and rural, that, that there's gonna be a single EMR across the specialists and the uh, primary care providers. There's generally gonna be a lot of uh, uh, different EMRs. And so you need some other way of uh, accomplishing that connection. Uh, one is with a um, uh, web app uh, that has uh, integration into the EMRs, like a, either a single sign-on, so it's a button within the EMR, um, or a way to launch it and uh, have that uh, single sign-on uh, process occur so that it's uh, easy for the um, physician or the staff who's ever uh, entering that information to, uh, to do so. Um, so different choices there. Uh, uh, one thing that uh, is still being uh, defined is the uh, consent process um, in California, which is currently um, as I said earlier, has that uh, all provider letter going out to uh, uh, Medicaid uh, plans um, and providers that the uh, consent at, at this point, although the final rules are not out, uh, will be uh, verbal. So, uh, you know, just like others, it, it's in the general consent to treat. Uh, and if there's a uh, verbal consent process that occurs, that's, uh, that's fine. Um, CMS uh, yeah, still being defined. Um, it, it was a point of contention on the uh, first round of rules. Uh, we'll see what the final rules uh, say. But there is a bill that would be uh, generated from that uh, uh, consulting physician at the far end. And so, you know, the, the patient, if they're responsible for 20% of the bill, Medicare, uh, they're going to be like, oh, wait, I got another bill? They, they want to know about that. You want to know that there's a uh, there's a consent to that because it will happen a lot faster than, you know, deciding to uh, actually show up at that specialist uh, visit at some later date. It's great. It's a great thing um, and uh, lower cost and all that good stuff and helps uh, provide access. Uh, but you want to make sure the, uh, the the patient is ready for that. Um, oh, so billing, uh, it's about uh, to be included uh, for Medicaid in California and CMS is unbundling, meaning it was there's codes there before they were existing, but uh, now they're unbundled so they can uh, they're about to be able to be billed for. Um, OK, well, let's go to the uh, the last uh, one here. And this is really talking about uh, the quote unquote system to the patient. Um, so here we're we're talking about a, uh, a health system or a health plan. Uh, but really kind of saying system, it means it's not from a particular person, uh, that there are ways of using digital health to uh, connect with uh, patients where at the, uh, at the one end of that, uh, of that interaction, uh, there's not a, uh, a person per se. There's some uh, coders and uh, uh, configurers configuring the, uh, software, uh, but these are going out and automated. And it can be uh, email or uh, IVR, an interactive voice recognition, so a phone call with voice, um, but here specifically talking about um, 
about text messages, which is a powerful way to uh, uh, to um, uh, set up a communication channel with patients or members because uh, you know uh, text messages are open, they're uh, ubiquitous, so everyone's using them. Um, this has to be with the consent of the patient um, uh, or member and, or at their request, which a request you know, during the requesting process, there's a consent there as well. So either way, uh, there's a consent for that uh, for that uh, communication channel to to open up. Some of the uh, application features that you would be looking for, uh, you know, one would be to have the, and we're really talking about this in terms of digital health solution as a uh, automated messages um, uh, to be able to refine those, configure those so the right ones are going out and they're going out to uh, quote unquote like patients. So, you know, all diabetics uh, that are, you know, 10 years after their uh, last uh, pneumococcal, uh, pneumococcal vaccination, uh, that they get a message that they're uh, due for that. For instance, um, uh, encryption at rest as per, you know, uh, Expectations now. Uh, HIPAA is technology agnostic, but then there gets to be uh, expectations across the industry, and they certainly need to meet those, and this would be one of them. Uh, but up to the point of the uh, carrier, uh, the text itself is unsecure on a on a on a phone, um, and so that's part of the reason that uh, members need to understand and consent to that. Um, but that. Um, uh, carrier is uh, transmitting the message and uh, you know just like the US mail doesn't need to be a business associate or, or HIPAA compliant per se it's just carrying that message that's uh, that's true for the uh, uh, carrier and then making sure that within the uh, within that application that TCPA is is really hardwired in uh, there's high fines there you don't want to fall outside of those some of those are uh, uh, time of day uh, you know no uh, messages after uh, 8 or 9 p.m., uh, you know, no more than if it's a um, health message. There, there are two levels of consent. One, one, one level of consent in the health care environment uh, is uh, the person has given you their cell phone. Uh, that's the express consent. Uh, uh, and with that, you can do exigent, or there's a kind of a legal word for important. You can do exigent healthcare messages uh, up to a certain amount of uh, frequency. So uh, two times per week, uh, within those hours, you can send an exigent uh, healthcare message. It's got to you know be important uh, about their healthcare and not be any way seen as uh, marketing. Um, but if it's importantly about their uh, healthcare, you can send a TCPA compliant. Uh, messages just having gotten the cell number of that uh, of that person, but all of that you want to be kind of uh, uh, hardwired in and structurally uh, part of the of the application so that you don't run afoul of those. Uh, and then making sure that there's you know good reporting capabilities on this. Uh, you know what is an automated function, and you need to know okay how many are going out, how often are they answered, how often is the action being taken, all of these things so that you know that your uh, return on investment uh, is there. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back to you, uh, David. Uh, I think we're just uh, kind of going to Q and A, so uh, we'll, we'll yep. Yep. open that up here. Up. Yep. Amanda, any, any can we uh, take this on mute? Yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, yep. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. So it looks like we got one question. Um, it's around twelve twenty. If you want to actually look at it, but I'll read it out loud. So it says. Where do we find the specs for the RPM codes 99453, 99454, 99457 as we are going to start billing Medicare and Medicaid for RPM next week? And again, it's no, a wrong. That's, it's a that's a, Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that uh, it's a, a great question with a very uh, you know specific and important answer related to billing. Uh, an advice that uh, you know sounds like needs to be nailed down, but uh, don't have the uh, answer to that you know uh, right right here. We could yeah, the, the remote patient monitoring codes. Um, I mean, this is sort of a new direction, um, and there are 
you know, some requirements for it about how long how long you're spending looking at some of these uh, um, sort of metrics on a per patient basis. Um, but yeah, I, I also don't have the specific answer to that. Yeah, I mean, there's um, you're, you're absolutely right, David. There's compliance issues there. You know, does your does your uh, technology allow you to, you know, circle back and confirm that you've uh, done these? You know, similar to the chronic care management uh, uh, CCM codes, uh, where there had to be at least 20 minutes of time, uh, you know, spent um, in that uh, process in order to bill in any given month. Um, it's yeah, there's 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 quite a there's quite a bit of layers to that. I would say. Yep. yep. All right, it looks like we got one other question about uh, the use of FaceTime um, and, you know, whether it's possible to use FaceTime for uh, telehealth visits. And, you know, this goes back to the issue I had discussed earlier about um, signing a BAA. And, you know, there's there isn't a specific requirement that the conduit of information, i.e., the telehealth platform um, sign a BAA. Um, Apple, for example, does not um, make BAAs available. Um, and you would also have to make sure that you're not storing the information in your iCloud. Um, FaceTime does use encrypted encrypted communication, so you know that that is possible. And if you do obtain patient consent. Um, patient consent should drive whatever you're doing. Um, but as a general rule, you know, there are very few telehealth applications that bill themselves as telehealth applications um, that don't make BAAs available to the providers that they're working with. So, right. you know, I am not an attorney, um, so I'm not administering legal advice here as my caveat. Um, so you would need right. to check this out with your uh, your counsel. Um, I think, as a general rule, you know, you would be discouraged from using an application like FaceTime, where the uh, the telecommunications vendor is not prepared to sign a, a BAA that includes you. Yeah, I think you're you're right on, David. It's that that BAA is a is a is a big deal. All right. Um, do we have any other questions for David and Greg? And you can you can unmute yourself if you want and ask it out loud if you want to, since we're at the end here. Going once. Going twice. Well, great. All right. Well, thank you, David and Greg. Any other last thank words you. before we wrap up here? Uh, no, uh, thank you. This is a, it's an exciting uh, uh, a time for uh, for these uh, services. So this, you know, with, with new billing coming into place and uh, uh, really accelerating the marketplace. So that's yes. a great time yes. for it. Yep. And please feel free to reach out if you have any additional questions or if there's any other way that we can be supportive. All right. Thank you both, and thanks everyone for joining today's webinar. Um, just a quick reminder to please make sure that you fill out the evaluation survey, and just like David and Greg said, feel free to contact any of the speakers, and we hope to see you at the, the next webinar next Tuesday. Thank you.